Hello friends, welcome to Smart Catalyst. Today we'll be seeing the current affairs of 26 December 2018. The articles we'll be seeing today are these seven. First one is about the prompt corrective action framework of RBI. Second article talks about FII that is foreign institutional investors in India. Third article talks about Bitcoin and their regulation in India. Fourth article is about the school dropout rate. Fifth one talks about the government's regulation to regulate social media. Sixth one is about the status of leopards in India. And the final article is about the status of newborns in our country. The first article we'll be seeing is, Bans under PCA framework are sitting on cash pile. So this article was taken from the newspaper Hindu. So we all know about the increasing non-performing assets in Indian banks. And it stands as about 14% of their total assets according to Economic Survey 2018. And out of 12 banks in the PCA framework, 11 are public sector banks. And these 11 public sector banks, they contribute to about 25% of the total commercial banks in our country. Because of the increasing non-performing assets in these banks, they have been placed under prompt corrective action framework by the RBI, which lays regulation on its lending amount. So because of this, the commercial banks under the PCA framework are having excess cash and they don't have much options to lend. So as these banks are unable to lend to any other external sources, their statutory liquidity ratio is increasing. So RBI mandated statutory liquidity ratio stands at about 19.5%. However, due to accumulating assets, the capital request, the statutory liquidity ratio of these banks, they stand at around 27 to 28%. So this phenomenon wherein uh, the banks are forced to invest in the government securities, which are risk averse in nature, is termed as lazy banking. So recently, the government of India has a plan for another set of capital infusion, especially to aid and help the public sector banks to come out of this prompt collective action framework. So with those measures, the banks will be able to come out of the framework, thereby providing them a mechanism to utilize this excessive funds, thereby giving a boost to Indian economy. The next article we'll be seeing is foreign fund outflows highest since 2008. This article was also taken from the newspaper Hindu. So what are foreign institutional investment? Wherein the foreign citizens invest in Indian equity markets. Uh, these foreign investors, they cannot directly come and invest in uh, Indian equity market. However, they can come only via registration of SEBI. However, certain exceptions like individuals with high assets they can directly invest in the Indian markets. This foreign institutional investment is different from foreign domestic investment. So in case of foreign domestic investment, generally a foreign company comes in the form of subsidiary or a joint venture to invest in Indian markets, thereby acquiring control of interest in the foreign entity set up in the other country. Whereas in case of foreign institutional investment, the investors come via equity investments in the form of mutual funds or foreign portfolio management companies, thereby making the foreign institutional investment highly volatile. Currently, the foreign institutional investors are pulling out of India owing to certain reasons. Uh, the first reason is the fall in the value of rupee. So Indian rupee has fell from its 64 rupee mark to 74 rupees against dollar in the past one year alone. This added with global volatility including US Fed hike rate and the increasing trade war between US and China which has its manifestations on, on all other global countries has forced the foreign institutional investors to pull out of India as they find other global markets more competitive. In addition to this, this strong institutional buying by the domestic investors, which has helped the Indian stock market considerably. India recently even overtook Germany for the first time in terms of its market capitalization. The third article we'll be seeing is Bitcoin on highway to being legit. This article was taken from the newspaper Indian Express. So the big fuss about Bitcoins, which are virtual currencies accessed via electronic platform has been in news for quite some time. So the government of India has set up two interdisciplinary committees in order to determine the legality of these bitcoins in our country. The first interdisciplinary committee was set up last year 
with members from Home Affairs, MITE, CBDT and Niti Aayog. However, the committee has recommended total ban on the cryptocurrency in India. Following this committee's recommendation, both RBI and Government of India has reinforced it via various orders. This year, the government has set up the second interdisciplinary committee to determine the legality of bitcoins and it includes members from SEBI, RBI as well as MITE. However, this committee is in favor of legalizing bitcoins in line with the global trends. So currently in India, since Bitcoin is beyond any regulation, it is being used as a source of money laundering and financial terrorism. This issue has been reiterated by the recent G20 meet, which released guidelines to regulate the use of Bitcoins. This interdisciplinary committee is taking the view of G20 resolution and has agreed to introduce regulation of cryptocurrency so that it can act as a counter to money laundering as well as financial terrorism problems in our country. So this uh, is also in line with the global body that is Financial Action Task Force, which is a main body to control financial terrorism. The next article we'll be seeing is Government School Dropouts in Classes 9 and 10 Increasing in Many States. So Unified District Information System for Education, which is a database containing information about all schools in India, has thrown light about this grim situation with respect to school dropout rates in our country. Uh, this rate of school dropouts in government school is poor both in developed as well as developing states. The developed states include Tamil Nadu, Telangana, whereas other states include Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Jharkhand and even Jammu Kashmir. Uh, the report also emphasized that the percentage of students dropping out at secondary class is higher when compared to the primary classes. This can be attributed to a uh, Right to Education Act. So one of the important provisions of Right to Education Act is non-detention policy. till class 8. According to this policy, no student can be retained in the same class. However, after class 8, this rule doesn't apply. This is attributed as one of the important reasons for students to drop out after the secondary class. So apart from this, a lack of awareness, lack of infrastructure including roads, lack of proper infrastructure, And the whole education system which concentrates more on enrollment rather than on quality. So the lack of quality education, the no detention policy and the coupled with the no detention policy of RTI Act together with other socio-economic situations prevailing in both rural as well as urban India has forced the students to drop out from the secondary grade in many states. The next article we'll be seeing is Government Drafts Rules to Regulate Social Media. This article was taken from the newspaper Hindu. So the government has recently released draft information technology intermediaries guidelines and amendment rules 2018. So this amendment rules is to amend the IT Act of 2002. So in this uh, proposed amendment, the government has proposed various suggestions to regulate the social media content as methods to curb mob violence as well as increasing lynchings in our country. So, uh, however, the Supreme Court of India has uh, voiced its concern over the changes brought in by the government as it stands against the right to privacy of individuals in our country. So, Article 19 of Indian Constitution, it gives right to freedom of speech to every citizen of our country has fundamental rights. However, this Article 19 is, doesn't come without reasonable restrictions. So the reasonable restrictions for this article include sovereignty, integrity, security of our country, friendly relationship with foreign states, public order, decency and morality, or any expression which incites a criminal offence or it can be in contempt of court. So any expression or action coming under this condition can be considered as an unlawful act by the Indian state. So the government of India has even classified few platforms as intermediary. So these intermediaries are the platforms which has more than 50 lakh users existing in our country. These intermediaries are specifically notified by government of India and it includes platforms such as WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook, etc.
most of these intermediary platform they use end to end encryption system so this end to end en encryption put the government in a difficult position to trace the data of origin especially in the recent incidences of increasing fake news induced hate crimes However, the Supreme Court has raised serious concerns about this draft rules released by the government of India. So, this this is seen as an attempt by the government to curb freedom of expression of Indian citizens and their right to free speech over internet, which is a free platform. So, this is even reiterated by the Supreme Court in its 2015 verdict called as Landmark Shreya Sinhal verdict. This section 66A of IT Act allowed any person to be arrested if he or she posted a offensive content over internet this acted as a roadblock to right to freedom of speech over the platform of internet the next article we'll be seeing is 260 leopards sports since 2015 so this is according to recent information released by ministry of environment forest and climate change so between the year 2015 to 2018 alone at least 260 leopards have been poached in our country the increasing incidences of uh, leopard poaching is a clear manifestation of man animal conflict this uh, man animal conflict is a direct result of overlapping of man and the leopard habitat the habitat of leopard includes forest deserts in rocky areas including mountain peaks and inland cliffs it also lives in grassland savanna as, as well as shrubland so because of increasing anthropogenic activities of man in the name of development more habitats of leopard are occupied by human beings and this has posed serious threats to survival of leopard community so the various forms of threats to leopard include number 1 is residential and commercial development so increasing housing and urban areas has resulted in overlapping of the man habitat to the leopard habitat so these threats include increasing residential and commercial development due to urbanization so this has also resulted in increased transportation and service corridors as well as increasing energy production and mining for accommodating the human needs increasing agriculture and aquaculture to provide food security is also an important threat all these has resulted in increased human intrusions causing disturbance to the ecosystem so which has caused modifications to the functioning of the natural ecosystems globally so the iucn status of leopard is vulnerable and indian states of chatisgarh and madhya pradesh houses maximum population of leopards and these are the states also having high number of leopard poaching cases the final article for the day is 30 million newborns cry out for help uh, so a study done by global coalition that includes unicef and world health organization has estimated that about 30 million newborns require specialized care in hospitals every year so in medical terminology first 28 days is considered as neonatal stage and this stage is very crucial for a child's biological and physical development and without any medical facilities at this stage a child may die due to many preventable health conditions so according to this study india currently witnesses 25.4 neonatal deaths for every 1000 child born however on the other hand the sustainable development goal targets for every country requires india to reduce this neonatal deaths to 12 for every 1000 live births This targets need to be achieved by the year 2030 for which considerable healthcare interventions are necessary. So without considerable uh, medical in timely interventions this may cause long term disability including cerebral palsy which may also affect the cognitive development of a child. 